they gave us a whole hour on nutritionals. A whole hour in, a four, whole hour. in four years of medical school. Mm -hmm. And they told us there's vitamin A and B1 and B2 and C and D and they're in alphabetical order and you can look them up. And then they told us some really basic facts. We got a whole hour. First of all, how much training did you receive on nutrition when you were in medical school? Because I know here in the States, it's almost none. Yeah, not much. Not much? Not much. Even it's Argentina? It's close to, to, yeah, yeah, very little. Close to none? Very little. Because you know, in medical school, they don't teach you, they don't teach you anything about nutrition. We got hours and hours and hours on how to use basically patent medicines, which as you know, are what usually goes on the prescription pad is a molecule that can be patented, which means it's not found in nature, because you can't patent it if it's not found in nature, if it's found in nature, and that's what we get educated in. They don't get paid to educate people, they get paid to write prescriptions. And, and, and you know, you can imagine the drug lobby made sure that's the case. The doctor is brainwashed when he gets out of medical school because the medical school has too much subsidization of the professors who are being paid by the drug company. So the professor never teaches any student in medical school. Why don't you try vitamin C? They're going to tell them the latest drug. And that's by design, specifically. You know, there about over a century ago, there's foundations, the Carnegie and the Rockefeller Foundations, who sort of engineered the curriculum through their uh, grants and donations. Are you wondering what Dr. Mercola meant when he mentioned that the Carnegie's and Rockefeller Foundation engineered medical school curriculum over a century ago? He was referring to the Flexner Report of 1910, which we addressed in A Global Quest. Now you can see why history is so important. Because, as the old saying goes, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. So, I don't need to go any further. You can understand when the money is coming from a source which uh, has a vested interest in the outcome. Now what's going to happen is the outcome is going to be what the donor wants it to be, generally. So this is the problem, and that goes back even further in time uh, to the uh, turn of the last century, um, when the um, Rockefeller group and the Carnegie group uh, actually came together, and they decided that they would uh, reform uh, medical education in America. At the time of the, you know, the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, 20th century, medical schools taught a lot of different things. There were homeopathic medical schools, there were naturopathic schools, there were eclectic herbal type medicine schools, mm -hmm. and so it, it was all there. There was not one way. And what happened was that the Rockefeller and Carnegie Foundations were interested in establishing the one way. Uh, how would they do that? Well, they would get a hold of the education system and create a, a, a medical monopoly via basically eliminating all competition to patent petrochemical medical education. That's the Flexner Report of 1910, it became known. Abraham and Simon Flexner, you know, were hired to do this. It was a preordained commissioned report. Not surprisingly, the basis of the report was that it was far too easy to start a medical school and that most schools we're not teaching sound medicine. Let me translate this for you. These natural health colleges were not pushing enough chemical drugs manufactured by who? Carnegie and Rockefeller. The AMA, who were evaluating the various medical colleges, made it their job to target and shut down the larger respected homeopathic colleges. Carnegie and Rockefeller began to immediately shower hundreds of millions of dollars on these medical schools that were teaching drug intensive medicine. Oh, by the way, when they donated the money, the donors would say, well, um, now we've given you a lot of money and we, we know you're going to do the right thing with it, but would you object if, um, if we had someone from our staff appointed to your board of directors, mm. just to make sure that our, just to see how our money is being spent, you know. Well, that was really a condition of getting the money, so you know the university said, well, that would be fine. You, I, anybody that you would suggest would be, I'm sure, more than adequate. So they began to load up the boards of directors of these uh, teaching centers with people who literally were on the payroll of uh, the donors. So once that was in place, uh, the curriculum of the universities, the teaching centers, swung completely in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs, and it has remained that way ever since. Predictably, those schools that had the financing churned out the better doctors. Oh, wait a minute, or should I say, the more recognized doctors. 
In return for the financing, the schools were required to continue teaching course material that was exclusively drug-oriented, with no emphasis on natural medicine. By 1925, over 10,000 herbalists were out of business. By 1940, over 1,500 chiropractors would be prosecuted for practicing quackery. The 22 homeopathic medical schools that flourished in the 1900s dwindled down to just two by 1923. By 1950, all the schools teaching homeopathy were closed. In the end, if a physician did not graduate from a Flexner approved medical school and receive an MD degree, then he or she could not find a job anywhere. This is why today MDs are so heavily biased towards synthetic drug therapy and know little about nutrition, if anything. Now this whole medical field has been skewed in the direction of pharmaceutical drugs, which are, can be patented and produce great profits for the uh, producers. And then the next step is that means that the anything coming from nature is excluded. Mm -hmm. And that's where we think, some of us think, that most of the promise lies in these, these very uh, complex substances found in herbs and plants and trees and things like that, mm -hmm. seeds. Um, we, some of us feel that it was probably meant to be that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you come out of the, all of this analysis and all of this history with the realization that the medical profession is really like a lap dog of the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. And most of the doctors have no idea that that's the case. They, mm -hmm. they don't understand this history.